Welcome to Managing Uncertainty, a podcast series from the experts at Bright Path discussing global risk, business continuity, and crisis management. Will you be ready to lead your organization through its critical moment? Welcome to the Managing Uncertainty podcast. This is Brian Strausser, Principal and Chief Executive here at Bright Path. And in this week's episode, I have with me my friend Steve Rafe of Starleaf. Steve, how are you? I'm great. Thanks, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad to have you. This is actually our first episode with a guest, so this is going to be uh, an adventure, I think, all around, plus a, a, a great conversation about Starleaf and your new product uh, that you just launched. So, Steve, tell us a little bit about you and a little bit about uh, Starleaf. Yeah, of course. So, um, let me let me start with myself. Uh, my name's Steve Rafe. Uh, I've uh, I've been at Starleaf for, for many years now, uh, for coming up to 12, in fact, and been in a variety of roles spanning uh, engineering, uh, marketing, sales, uh, product. So I've been around around the block there, and you know, in all the cases, uh, a keen interest of mine has been making sure that what we do makes a difference. That we are uh, helping businesses be better, uh, and helping helping individuals with their interests too. So uh, for Starleaf, uh, we were founded in two thousand and eight, uh, and we started off as the first video platform entirely in the cloud. We got there before Zoom, uh, before Microsoft, we were the first. Uh, and today we're a single platform for, for messaging, meeting, and calling. So uh, think of it as a, a full enterprise comms platform. Um, and through that, we're a Gartner visionary. And a key USP of ours has always been resiliency. And we own our own data centers uh, with all of our kit, which means we offer a five nines SLA to our customers, mm -hmm. uh, which Compared with the market leader, which is three nines, uh, we are highly resilient. So through this, uh, we've always been chosen by businesses where enterprise comms are critical. Uh, an example would be the National Health Service in, in the UK, who literally rely on us for life and death situations. Mm -hmm. So simply, when businesses need enterprise comms that are resilient, reliable, and available, they choose Starleaf. Mm -hmm. That's us, Brian. Steve, how would you describe your 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 kind of customer base? Is it primarily you know really large organizations, or do you kind of run the gamut of different sizes of businesses? Yeah, across the board, really. I mean, our our sweet spot really has been uh, with with resiliency. So so with that, uh, you know, that's brought with it a, a multitude of organizational sizes because there are there are many small businesses out there where resiliency is is top of their agendas. And equally, there are many large businesses out there where resiliency is important. So, uh, yeah, across the spread, Brian. Mm -hmm. So the last, as we've kind of worked through the pandemic, uh, you know, we, we were kind of confronted with this situation where suddenly a lot of businesses shifted to working from home where they could. You know, manufacturers obviously couldn't uh, do that when in terms of building and testing things. But a lot of knowledge workers, information workers, and, and probably some uh, some industries we didn't think about being able to work remotely, being able to work from home, have had to shift to that. And as we've all read, that's really led to some significant changes in the workplace. You know, we've moved to something that's been more hybrid uh, focused. We were more remote and then now kind of more hybrid as folks start to come back to the office in at least some parts of the world. I, I'm curious how that, you know, what what you see being in this space as a cloud-based, you know, messaging and, and meeting provider uh, at Starleaf, what's this look like to you on the other end of that question, you know, as companies have had to make this shift very rapidly? Yeah, it's a fair question, Brian. And I, I think it's fair to say that uh, pre-pandemic, all businesses had some plan to digitalize, that there were some, uh, some, some of the way through. But the pandemic truly supercharged that because suddenly overnight, they had to enable people to, to work from their, their homes during multiple lockdowns. And um, there was a revolution in the way we communicate. Face-to-face um, -face meetings were suddenly replaced by uh, video meetings. Uh, office spaces were replaced by our home offices. And a key enabler for this was enterprise communications and collaboration services mm -hmm. like our own, uh, like Microsoft Teams, WebEx, Zoom, which uh, suddenly are all household names where potentially they weren't before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And now they're a part of the core tool set that's enabling hybrid working, of course. And I'd say both business and society are set to win from hybrid working. I mean, businesses, mm -hmm. clearly, there's a direct impact on productivity and therefore their, their bottom line. But for society, you know, my view there is that it's, mm -hmm. it's creating more inclusive 
uh, workforce. Suddenly, uh, people in all sorts of situations and geographies can be part of the conversation. And it's also increasing flexibility where people can have, a, would say, a much better home work life balance, maybe cut out uh, many commuting hours. And I'd say off the back of that, it actually brings a lot more purpose to what we do because suddenly we can be we can be part of the conversations that previously maybe we weren't able to be. Um, and I would say off the back of that, Brian, that uh, businesses who embrace hybrid working are set to be the, the winners, not, not only from those direct impacts, mm-hmm. but attracting and retaining top talent. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to me. I mean, we had <clears throat> the cultural changes in business, I think, have been pretty fascinating. There's, uh, for example, we have a client um, that is, I, I would best describe their pre-pandemic leadership style as, as pretty old school. Like if if you weren't in the office from eight to five, eight to four doing work and leaders weren't there to see you, their perspective was that you just weren't working. And this whole idea of remote work was entirely a, a foreign concept to them. They didn't support it. They didn't believe in it. They didn't think it was possible. Now they had to go home. Um, and, and they're in a, a fairly conservative part of the United States where um, even that was, you know, they were pretty reluctant politically, that part of the country to do that. But they had to go home because of the pandemic. And it's been a complete eye opener for their leadership team to realize that they can't with the right tools, they can do this and they can adapt to this change. And it's really opened their eyes to the amount of talent that they could bring into the organization that would never have moved to that state and city. Um, because it's not a place that, you know, some folks will want to live. Um, but they, they have found this amazing ability to bring in talent and retain talent and be more flexible around that than they had ever been before. And as they've started to think about their return to the office strategy and have started to go back to the office, uh, I think less than half the team is going to go back physically and they're going to have a permanent workforce, um, that, that, it, it's really changed their approach on how they think about talent. So I put them in the reluctant winner category, right? They, they went from just being opposed to this idea to really embracing it and being able to move forward in a, in a different way. And I think it positions them really well for the, the talent war that we're all sort of in right now. Yeah, we, 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 we totally are, Brian. It's, it's great to hear. And it's funny, isn't it, that for, uh, I'm guessing decades now, uh, managers around the world have been told to, to judge their teams on their outputs, not on the inputs. Mm-hmm. Yet, um, uh, yeah, I think the, the the client you describe, they obviously uh, judged that presenteeism was a was an important thing, and they're, they're, they're not on their own. And mm-hmm. you know, clearly, the pandemic turned that on its head because they were they were forced to mm-hmm. uh, to accept that uh, they weren't going to be able to have people in the office. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. In some ways, I think if we can draw a positive out of the pandemic, it's that it's it's forced it's forced many people's hands around the world to truly treat employees like like human beings, to mm-hmm. understand that if you motivate them, if you bring them into your mission, if you get them on board with your story, get them motivated, they'll do great things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been I, I think it's also been a really interesting time to be in the space that that I've spent my career in, in business continuity and crisis management and you know, even my colleagues that are in information security or cybersecurity, um, because companies have really looked to these functions to lead through this pandemic um, and help drive some of these strategic conversations like the one we're talking about here with talent and resiliency and these kind of capabilities and, and really changing not just how we think about work, but how we do work in these situations. And there's definitely been, I think there's been some total mindset sh- mind shift and strategy changes that have happened here where for example if you think about business continuity we used to center a lot of business continuity around i have a physical workspace and if i lose that physical workspace i need to recover to a comparable workspace i need to go back to a you know brick and mortar physical location to do my work and i don't think we think that way at all anymore I think it has completely upended that idea that if I lose my headquarters, for example, because of some natural disaster or fire or flood or, you know, what have you, I used to think about how do I replicate office space for 500,000 people, or I'm sorry, for 500,000 square feet worth of people and and equipment. Well, now I just send them home, right? They can work in, in almost every case, they can work remotely. 
So I think it's completely changed the way we think about what used to be a core focus of business continuity, and we just don't think about that anymore. So do, do you think it's fair to say, Brian, that there are some real real wins for business continuity through through the pandemic? I think there are um, for companies that, you know, kind of like we were just talking with kind of company strategy as a whole, I, I, for companies that I think, companies and business kind of leaders that I think can capitalize on what's happening and think about how that trend impacts what's going on in their organization. I think business continuity, crisis management, infosec leaders that think about how this repositions their role, their strategy, and how they address the I mean, this also raises new threats that need to be addressed. Um, I think the ones that do that well are going to come out of this um, with a stronger capability in their organization, a stronger, more resilient company, and probably more credibility and authority for themselves as leaders in these spaces than they had before. Um, And of course, I think I I won't say the losers, but the ones that don't capitalize on that or don't realize the strategic shift that's happened uh, will have the opposite impact. Uh, and we've seen, we've seen some of that out there as well. I mean, mind, mind shift changes like this, paradigm shifting changes like this don't come along all that often and, and they're hard sometimes for folks to recognize. Completely agree with you, Brian. And you mentioned, you mentioned risks there. And I think, you know, for me, the, the key thing here is to maximize, for businesses to maximize their exposure to the positive aspects mm-hmm. that uh, the pandemic has brought about and minimize the impact of the negatives. And you know, specifically on those risks, one of the things that uh, we've been talking to a lot of businesses about recently has been this new dependency on these enterprise comms platforms to support critical activities, mm-hmm. and you know, clearly over the last uh, the last 18, 24 months, the focus has been on survival. Let's face it. To start off with, it, it was how on earth do we get our workforce up and running at home? How on earth do we accelerate our digitalization? How do we drive adoption of those tools? How do we adapt our processes to uh, get them to be able to work remotely across these tools? And um, the focus now we're seeing with business leaders is shifting to realizing that they've now, uh, to use a phrase, put all their eggs in one basket. They're suddenly very reliant on these tools for these critical activities. And they've had a great impact on these critical activities, but suddenly they're exposed. Let, let me give you an example of, of one of these critical use cases. Uh, we've been talking with a, a European pharmaceutical company, and uh, for them, WebEx has just revolutionized vaccine production for them. Hmm. Uh, it allows them to run a just-in-time manufacturing process between multiple factories and third-party suppliers where everyone can collaborate. And that's had a, a, an immediate financial impact for them and the ability for them to, to deliver on contracts. Uh, however, um, because they've got a robust business continuity program governance, they've, they've been through analysis cycles to work out the risks to these critical activities, and they've identified that that WebEx is now a key dependency Mm -hmm. on vaccine production, which, (laughs) now I say it out aloud, sounds like dreadfully scary. (laughs) Would we we have ever thought that (laughs) before the pandemic? (laughs) Yeah, quite. So, you you know, for me, for for, for businesses to, to come out as the true winners from this situation, they need to maximize their exposure to the positive aspects, which I think businesses have always been forced to do through the pandemic, to enable hybrid working, to allow people to work flexibly, to digitalize. Uh, and now's the time to start minimizing exposure to the negative aspects. Mm-hmm. And that's where I really believe is a great moment for business continuity professionals to, to mm-hmm. shine. You know, mm-hmm. for me, this is there's never been a time where their businesses need them more. Yeah, I, I would agree. I I remember early in the pandemic when um, I had just been in in London for school, February 2020. And of course, Europe, you were farther. You saw this a a, a few weeks before we really saw the impact here in the U.S. And I came back from that trip and started talking to clients saying, hey, this is going to be a really bad problem. Um, and we had started to see, you know, there was some impact in China and started to see some impact in India. And then it's kind of coming through Europe. Um, it was clearly coming here. And so our clients that reacted quickly and looked at the threat and then started taking actions, they were the ones that were best off 
as the pandemic really hit home and we had to shift to remote work and go through lockdowns and, you know, work restrictions because they were early movers. They saw the threat coming. Um, and the ones that had strong programs that had credibility with their leadership that had thought through some of these challenges, like you were just outlined and then moved quickly. I mean, they were the ones that got their hands on the, the needed resources like Wi-Fi hotspots and laptops and things that suddenly became in really short supply around the world as everybody started to shift home. I mean, there's a period of time uh, you couldn't even buy a web camera anywhere in the U.S. I mean, there, the, the supply chain was empty. So I think, you know, having that credibility up front and being able to move quickly and have that ability to evaluate and talk about threats like that as they're coming in, um, those leaders really came out well, and as did their companies as we went through this pandemic. I think you raise an interesting point there with, with, with resilience, the resilient organizations, I think there's different levels, right? That are they, at a base level, you get to maintain a, a minimum viable operating level as a business mm-hmm. that gets you through a, a situation that was, that, that was unplanned, unexpected. But you can go further than that, right? That if you're more resilient than your competitors, actually suddenly these That's right. awful circumstances can turn, can, can turn into a competitive opportunity for mm-hmm. you. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to the, the age-old challenge with um, crisis management and business continuity teams is how do you, what are the metrics that you can explain to your business leaders that aren't subject matter experts? And you can always say, well, here's our, you know, we have 125 plans and they were all updated this year and et cetera. But the, to me, that's kind of table stakes. Like we expect you to do that in the organization. It's when you start to look at, hey, we moved more quickly than our competitors. And in doing so, we were able to do X, Y, Z. Um, I remember during um, Hurricane Sandy a decade ago here in the U.S. and I was working for a Fortune 500 retailer at the time. Um that was one of the metrics we came up with with our trade association was, hey, if all of you other retailers would share your reopening rates, we'll share ours. Like how quickly were you open each day or what percentage of your store is in the impacted area? Well, of course, we were the fastest. And so I was able to give that data to our business intelligence team and say, here's our competitors and us. Tell me what the delta was in sales. What did we gain by being open first? Well, that number was huge and that became our ceo's favorite story to tell the board about hurricane sandy followed preceded by no one got hurt Uh, none of our employees were injured and their families were okay followed by we reopened faster than our competitors and because of that we recognized x millions of dollars in additional revenue so you know there's a great chance to to use information like that and there's similar stories from the pandemic as you point out to really push the credibility and and gain additional resources and capabilities for your for your team, and not to mention your company's resiliency. So, with that in mind, Brian, yeah, I think um, one thing I'd I'd really like to uh, to help with on this this episode today is to explore some of these uh, these these negative effects, mm-hmm. so that maybe we can help your listeners mm-hmm. protect themselves against those to, to mitigate the risks that, that that could come along, so they can so they can benefit maximally from the positives. How, how does that sound? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the, one of the examples I think we were talking through earlier was, you know, kind of, um, cybersecurity related issues. And this, as this dependency on technology grows, that becomes a, and, and people are at home. Uh, there's a, a whole different set of challenges that, that get opened. And I think you had a good example, uh, from your guys's experience to talk through. Yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it? That um, I think it is a good example, but I'm not sure the word "good" is uh, is, is is entirely <laughs> fair. Um, it's really a, a story of woe. I mean, the I think that the broad thing here is that cybercrime um, for for people who are involved in this, I, I need not say this. It's it's increasing in frequency and sophistication, and ultimately, there are just bad people out there targeting good businesses like those uh, those of your listeners. And at the same time, there's a rise in cyber warfare with state-sponsored attacks, which um, are typically known as advanced persistent threats, which take place on large businesses, which which might be the businesses of your listeners, or you know, indeed they might be their supply chain, uh, for instance, their enterprise communications provider. Uh, now, the, the the example I have is a a, a German customer we were talking to earlier this year, where their 
their environment was penetrated by uh, by bad actors. And when they realized it had been penetrated, they had well-drilled cyber incident response plans, and they, they swung into action like a well-oiled machine. But their CISO was really quite frustrated about the sluggish response. Now, it turned out after the fact, what had happened was the bad actor had got into the Microsoft Teams chat group that they were using <laughs> to coordinate their cyber incident response. And not only were they multiple steps ahead in terms of uh, in terms of being able to evade their uh, their actions to understand what was going on and boot them out the network, but they were also gathering critical uh, comms on on what was going on and how the company was responding to their industry partners and customers, and they were owning the narrative publicly in order to try and back this company into a corner and force them to pay the ransom. I mean, these <laughs> these attackers are insanely insanely sophisticated. Mm-hmm. And and if that wasn't the worst thing, um, they they took the very bold decision to disconnect access to all of their Microsoft 365 services to contain this attack. And we're, we're talking about a large German manufacturing conglomerate mm-hmm. here. They suddenly realized how massively dependent they've become on these tools in order to to operate all of their business processes. And they were they were on their knees from an operational standpoint. And what's worse is that their crisis management, sorry, their crisis communications platform was also dependent on Microsoft Teams. So they were <laughs> unable to let anyone know what was going on. Uh, so they were they were really in a, in a horrendous place. And in, in total, it took them several weeks to get back to, a, uh, to an operating basis, during which time there was untold financial and reputational damage to mm-hmm. their business. So you can see there were, there were almost two modes of risk from from cyber warfare, cyber attacks to uh, to an enterprise comms platform, one of them is it directly being damaged by the attackers. So, for instance, they can uh, they could take down Active Directory, which just stops anyone mm-hmm. signing in to mm-hmm. these services. Um, but the other way is you might actually proactively decide to remove access mm-hmm. as a business in order to contain the attack. And you know, alongside this, you could argue should you use these tools at all when you know your environment's been compromised. Because particularly if credentials have been compromised, mm-hmm. those attackers are probably looking for powerful information that they can use in order to back you into a corner. So it's a, it's a real challenge, Brian. So in this case, I, I just want to make sure folks capture the impact here. They had to remove all access to Office 365. So Teams, Word, Excel, PowerPoint access, email, SharePoint, probably all of that was unavailable during that uh, outage, which was multiple weeks, it sounds like. That's right. It was multiple weeks. And and yeah, it was it was literally turning off people's ability to log into the services. So I, I mean, right. I don't know exactly the details. I imagine you might still be able to, you know, load up Microsoft Word on your laptop and process something offline. Mm-hmm. But frankly, the number of places where I'm able to do that nowadays is minimal because mm-hmm. everything's stored, or stored centrally on SharePoint right. or OneDrive. Yeah. And all that impact would be, that'd be significant. I mean, I think um, document processing is one thing, but document storage, OneDrive, SharePoint, and the ability to communicate Teams and, and email Outlook Exchange in this case, that that would have a huge impact on most organizations. Yeah, and also um, I uh, you know understand things like um, cyber incident response runbooks and, and so on and so forth. The, the critical process documents you need to mount an effective response uh, you mm-hmm. know if you can't get hold of those then you're mm-hmm. you're in real trouble that's a really it's a really bad situation there <laughs> yeah i mean i, I mean the the, the the poor company i mean needless to say um it's amazing how that escalated um uh, cyber uh, defense but also the ability to respond and recover from it up the agendas of the uh, the people who were holding the purse strings suddenly uh, they had a um uh, a large amount of budget released to protect against these things. I guess it's just human <laughs> nature, right? That it's easy to not prepare for these things, but when they happen, uh, you get worried about it happening again. <clears throat> this is something that uh, I, I think a lot of folks don't think to practice. Um, we we usually, as we think about you know the life cycle of of exercises, um, you know most teams are using Zoom, or most organizations are using Zoom or Teams or WebEx or another similar product like yours for communication. Um, in a crisis, a lot of companies don't think to practice what happens if that gets disrupted or compromised. And so 
then they if they don't have a backup uh, or they haven't thought about what would we do if that happened? Like, what's our procedure? Do we go to a conference bridge? Do we, you know, use FaceTime? I and mean, there's a lot of different options that are out there. But a lot of companies just don't think about that and don't practice it. And then when it hits, they're they're really kind of paralyzed because they're not sure what to do. It's interesting you say that, Brian, because um, one thing we've come across quite a lot, and we'll come into a bit to talk a bit about what, what Starleaf are doing here. But mm-hmm. uh, to give you an example of um, some businesses who think they're protected here, so they will, let's, for example, say they are um, entirely on board with Microsoft Teams. They use it for everything. But they've still got a bunch of Zoom licenses, which they mm-hmm. use as their backup. And then you start to walk them through. Well, OK, so let's imagine that Microsoft Teams fails now, mm-hmm. right now. How many scheduled video meetings do you have per day? And they sort of do the back of the uh, the, the bit of mental arithmetic there and work out it's tens of thousands of meetings a day. And then you ask them how much of those they're going to need to reschedule on their Zoom licenses. And they say, well, actually, oh. probably most or all of them. Yeah. And you say, well, who's going to do that? And how are you going to do it? So I think sometimes people lull themselves into a false sense of security by thinking they've got a backup because they've invested in, in, in a technology. But actually, maybe, as you rightly say, Brian, they, haven't, they certainly haven't exercised this. Mm-hmm. But before that, they haven't even run through the, the, the mental steps of what they might do if, mm-hmm. uh, if, if, if a bad incident happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we, um, th- we did an exercise a few years ago with a client that was you know, fairly mature in their response processes. And in the middle of the, it was a ransomware exercise, in the middle of the exercise, they decided um, to have their communications team try to communicate with the you know, simulated uh, bad actor in this case. So we decided, well, I wonder what would happen if we sent them an attachment, if they'd open it. Um, so we, you know, in the exercise environment, we sent them an attachment and the attachment said, if you open this document, please raise your hand. And we were all in kind of a theater style uh, room back. This was pre pandemic. So th- what the communications team did in this case is they just forwarded the email out to the entire crisis team, the 40 some people in the room. And about a minute later, several people started raising their hands <clears throat> and the uh, incident leader said, oh yeah, did you have something to say? Well, yes, I opened this document and it said, if I opened it, I was supposed to raise my hand. So the three people that opened it were the internal CIO, the uh, head of uh, R&D engineering over their products and the head of product management. So (laughs) we informed them that their machines were compromised and anything that they were doing and any channels of communication were now compromised. And they're like, well, we're all in the team's chat about the incident. Okay. Well, the attacker now knows everything that you've been talking about here. And you can just kind of see the room deflate in that situation because it's, I mean, they, they should know that, you know, not to open such things, but these are real life things that happen. I mean, it happened in this exercise and it happens for real when these incidents are actually happening. Um, as you just described with the, the, the company in Germany that was compromised in the same way, the entire response is compromised. I mean, you just can't imagine how bad that would be. And of course we're all human. So we're, we're, we've just got yeah. a propensity to do these things, Brian, we're inquisitive. Even senior IT leaders will do these things, <laughs> but you know, so cyber cybercrime is a uh, is, is a definite definite threat to these uh, these digital communication and collaboration services. Uh, absolutely, uh, another one we we come across quite a bit, Brian, is is service outages, which you know, simply these services they're, they're, they're SaaS cloud services, so they're they're highly reliable, but not a hundred percent reliable. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say that the, the the larger risk to these services are. The potential for hyperscale public cloud outages. Um, this was predicted actually in a there's a there's a great paper called the Alliance Risk Barometer, which goes over this, and they they predict a, a one of these hyperscale public cloud outages at some point in the next few years. And just as I was reading it, my newsfeed ticked over with Facebook having a <laughs> having had a massive outage, and I was like, oh yeah, they're not they're not wrong, but you know, simply these these hyperscalers. They uh, they not only have these incredibly complicated clouds to run, which in the case of Facebook, it's it's believed to have been a misconfiguration mm-hmm. that caused a, a ripple effect that caused a catastrophic failure in in the really quite sophisticated cloud. Uh, but the the other effect, of course, is these advanced persistent threat actors. 
these nation states who are trying to disrupt. And what better way to disrupt than attack the core productivity tool that enables uh, businesses in uh, one of the countries that they they don't like? I mean, it's a it's a credible and powerful threat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> I remember the Facebook outage. Uh... Primarily, I was irritated because I had just bought an Oculus and it arrived that morning and I couldn't set it up because Facebook was down. Um, but uh, the, converse, the conversation that was happening in, you know, the business continuity community um, and with some of our partners uh, in the federal government here in the U.S. was, was this, is, you know, everyone thought, just assume this was a cyber attack. Like which, which nation state or which organization is attempting to disrupt Facebook. And of course, it turned out, as you pointed out, it was an internal misconfiguration that cascaded into a pretty significant failure for them. But I think everyone's initial response was, well, someone took Facebook down. There ha- this had to have been an attack. Um, and certainly that there's going to be a time where that's true. It just wasn't in this case. Yeah, I just was reading a, a document the other day that says that uh, so, so much of uh, uh, cyber resilience, network resilience, uh, budgeting goes towards defense. It's against trying to prevent these things from happening, which, which of course is great. Your businesses absolutely should invest in that, but not to the detriment of investing in the things you're going to need to get yourself back on your feet when these bad mm-hmm. things happen. Because mm-hmm. however well you defend yourself, there's always a risk that the bad thing's going to happen. It's going to happen. What what you're going to do, who you're going to call. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think there's there's vast differences in how organizations think about that fence too. I mean, some some companies are think about that fence in terms of how do I how how do I make sure I'm compliant with my regulatory requirements, whether those uh, whether that's a standard they're following like high trust uh, or or direct trust or or something like that, ENAC standards, or am I positioning against a determined external threat? which I would argue those companies are better positioned uh, than ones who are just thinking about this as, a, as an item of regulatory compliance. But you're right. You have to balance that with what are your capabilities to recover? What are your capabilities to be resilient in the face of that disruption that surely is going to hit you at some point, uh, despite whatever your defenses are internally and externally? Yeah, that, I think there has there has talent. to be a balance there, Brian. There has to be a balance between the two. We, we need to defend ourselves, but also we need to have some ways of mitigating. And mm-hmm. you know, I, I mentioned these, um, you know, the unavailability of these platforms directly and them going down. But the other area is is you know indeed the the risks between those services and and your end users as a business, uh, mm-hmm. the the supply chain in particular. Uh, another another example of this would be. There was a, a multi-hour outage of Microsoft services in Germany earlier this year. And uh, I mean, all Microsoft 365 services were unavailable, ironically, including the service status page. Uh, you think maybe <laughs> like, I don't know, maybe maybe Amazon should should host Microsoft and Microsoft should host Amazon, so I don't know, something like that. But uh, you know, Microsoft reported this as a, as a service provider issue and um, rummaging around the forums, uh, it, it seems that from what the IT community gleaned, it looks like Deutsche Telekom, who are the, the largest ISP in Germany, just had a, a network misconfiguration that, that turned Germany off for, for Microsoft 365 services mm-hmm. and caused this multi-hour outage. I mean, I wonder what the cost, the cost to, uh, to, to, to Germany's economy was over, over that multi-hour period. Yeah, probably significant uh, in, in this case. I mean, that's a huge organization uh, and a lot of impact there across the country. So I think really in, in summary, these these enterprise communications and collaboration tools, they're they're, they're tremendously powerful. They've uh, they've they've delivered amazing benefits to both businesses and society, and they're now a key dependency for business critical activities. And there are growing credible threats to the availability of these tools. Mm-hmm. So resilient businesses must recognize this and and put in place steps to, to mitigate these risks. Mm-hmm. So there's definitely an action here for business continuity and IT leaders, I think, to think through, and that is recognizing that this dependency exists. This is a huge dependency for organizations in 2021. That dependency probably increases in the years ahead as the workforce, con- the workplace continues to adapt. Um, but part of it is recognizing that exists and then thinking about, well, what do I do? Not just what's my recovery strategy, but what do I do when this outage happens? 
you know, what are, what are my options to continue services while I figure out how to get my primary provider back online, my primary tool, WebEx or, or Zoom. And of course, for companies, there's not a lot they can do. They're dependent upon the vendor to, that's providing this service. Um, the company's decision is, you know, how do I work around this? Is there a workaround uh, that's out there? I think that's a key thing for business continuity and, and crisis management, infosec, IT leaders to really think through. And so really validation for you that, that Brian, yeah. I was talking to a, a large Californian um, uh, media company the other day, and uh, they, they used almost exactly the words there. They said that this is a growing, a growing issue. And they said the frustrating thing is we've got no control over it or no visibility into it. They, they, they just they can't control it or see what's going on or right. what the potential threats are. You know, one, one of our clients uh, highlighted this really well. We were talking about their IT team, uh, I guess, a week and a half ago. And uh, they were, um, they've moved that uh, most of their IT infrastructure is now in the cloud. So between their internal stuff on AWS and shifting everything else to vendors. And they're really clear about, hey, we recognize that we've essentially, in some cases here, we've eliminated a lot of risk because we're not trying to host this stuff internally we've added a whole different kind of risk because now I'm paying a vendor to do this, but I have no control and no internal visibility into what's happening. And so I've shifted my risk in an entirely different direction and I might feel good about part of this. I don't feel good about the rest, but that's, you know, those are, that's the strategic decision that they have made that they're now having to really kind of think through. Zoom was the example they were using in that case. They were like, well, we, if, if, you know, we can't, we can't control it. And we don't have we don't have good visibility when things go go bad for us in this situation. Yeah, indeed. So as you rightly say, Brian, I think I think the only thing that can be done in these situations is to to accept that there's no no control, no visibility over that, and mm-hmm. and uh, and and plan plan accordingly for it. So I think this is where you know we shift to talking about your you your company has launched a a, a solution for this your your new product. Uh, Starleaf Standby, I think, was really aimed at that gap of understanding um, what do we do when these kind of disruptions happen? How do I, you know, how do you kind of position your, your what's there rather as a solution to really address that gap that's been created as we've made this shift? So, so Steve, tell us about your new product. Yeah, thanks, Brian. It's it's it's, it's exactly that, really. It's it's allowing businesses to protect themselves against the potential negative impacts of this, which allow them to embrace the positives which affect their business and society. So at its, um, in a nutshell, Starleaf Standby is an enterprise communications platform for business continuity and cyber resiliency. And at its core is an enterprise communications failover service. So when your primary platform is down, you can enable Starleaf Standby and it instantly replicates that primary environment and then informs all of your users that what's happened so they can carry on working on our platform and they can carry on with uh, their, their, their critical business activities, maintain a minimum viable uh, operating level. Uh, and also it can be used for crisis communications and uh, other things that you need during disruptive events. So the, the way this works is that we're continually maintaining a, a cache of the primary collaboration platform. So we understand things like, you know, what meetings are coming up that are that are hosted on uh, Microsoft Teams, WebEx, Zoom, with the platform of your choice. And uh, when an administrator clicks the uh, enable style standby button, we simply recreate all of those meetings on our platform and then email and text message users to let them know what's going on and to let them know they can get straight back into their into their meetings. So that's the core part, this collaboration failover solution. Mm -hmm. But then surrounding that are a suite of tools that uh, assist in disruptive events uh, before, during, and after them. So, so for example, before uh, you can do outage and incident simulation. So you you can exercise, as you were saying earlier, Brian, you can exercise your business continuity plans, uh, your incident run books, and make sure that you truly have protected these critical activities. And we encourage our customers as part of their onboarding process to do this and help them through the, uh, through the activity. Then during the event, we've got uh, broadcast messaging uh, built in. So you can let 
people know what's going on. Um, and because we've got this fully featured enterprise comms platform, you can be pretty sophisticated there, Brian. So we're talking you could do a, a full-on CEO video address out to the entire mm-hmm. company in a, in a sort of town hall style with live, live Q&A coming back. And then after the event, we've got audit logging, which means that mm-hmm. you can go back in, look at what went well, what didn't, learn from what's happened, practice continuous improvement, uh, and so on and so forth. So I don't know, just relating back to that, that, uh, that example I, I shared earlier about the, uh, the German customer who was, uh, who was hit by a cyber attack. So uh, let me talk you through how Starleaf Standby could have helped them. So at the point the breach was discovered, they could have used Starleaf Standby to coordinate their incident response. And because it's operationally air-gapped from their primary platform, it's completely independent it's secure, it's confidential. It means the bad actor is significantly less likely to be snooping on, on their comms. Uh, another powerful thing there is that most businesses are working with third parties to assist with uh, cyber incident response, maybe an MDR mm-hmm. provider, their backup provider, their recovery providers. We've got cross-organizational capabilities so they can have war rooms set up, pre-set up in Starly Standby so that when the incident happens, everyone is immediately plugged in. They can even do things like pin their, uh, their, 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 their playbooks there. So they've got their process documents to hand in that, uh, in that platform. So that's the first thing. Uh, now, at the point they decided to contain the breach by disconnecting Microsoft services, there's a couple of ways Starly Standby could help. The first is that core collaboration failover functionality that's going to allow all of their users to continue uh, maintaining the critical business activities that are going on, maintain a minimum viable level of operation. But second to that, they could also use it for crisis messaging. So the mm-hmm. CEO can brief everyone on what's going on and they can continue to brief them regularly as things go on. They can use it for command and control as well in, in the same way. And then uh, the bit I didn't mention before was the recovery phase of, uh, of, of this, this cyber attack. It took several weeks for them to recover their primary platform. And this is one thing that I understand from having talked to uh, various uh, backup and recovery providers that very often businesses uh, fixate on the backup part, but not so much the recovery part. Mm-hmm. And when they realize they've got to restore petabytes of data to a distributed set of uh, servers, a distributed set of workloads around the world, they realize that the raw time for transferring the data is measured in weeks, let alone actually staging the thing and getting it up and running. Mm-hmm. Uh, it turns out that many ransoms are paid for ransomware simply because it costs more to recover That's right. from backup than it would to just pay the ransom. So you know, we can help there too, because mm-hmm. if you imagine um, there's a minimum viable level of operations running in the background, it can, it can open up options to do things like not pay ransoms. Mm-hmm. It can open up options for the recovery team to be able to work um, at a uh, you know a less intense pace and do things right because they know there's a backup there helping them. So really, that that's Starly Standby, Brian. It's an enterprise communications platform for business continuity and cyber resiliency. It's it's unique as far as we know. We've talked to um, to, to hundreds of businesses and analysts and consultants like yourself about this now, mm-hmm. Brian, and uh, everyone agrees that uh, this is timely. It's uh, it's an acute need, and uh, simply we can't find a a mountain tall enough or a voice loud enough to shout off about mm-hmm. it. Uh, we we can help in these situations. We can help protect against the possible negative impacts of digitalization and help businesses therefore embrace these massive positive effects it has for them, their employees, and ultimately society from uh, mm-hmm. from hybrid working. Yeah, I think you are in a unique position here. Um, I remember, uh, you know, we first started speaking a few weeks back about doing this episode. And I was talking with one of our, you know, more forward thinking clients a few days later. And I I asked him um, if their IT team had ever gone down the road of, you know, what would they do if Microsoft Teams was there, they're on Teams? What would they do if Teams wasn't available? And we knew that we had some what they had some WebEx licenses in the environment, which is their former platform um, that they would switch to. But at the same time, they have several thousand employees. And as you say, tens of thousands of meetings a day. I was like, well, here's, you know, here's a product I just heard about and kind of explained it a little bit. And they got really excited about that um, because they didn't have 
there wasn't this kind of capability that existed, this ability to really almost hot failover to an alternate communications capability. Um, and they're realizing, you know, we manage incidents and cyber incidents and customer problems and all kinds of things through teams and tools that are plugged into teams um, and that they didn't have this capability. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know of anything else that's in the marketplace that does quite what you're describing in terms of the standby capability for communications. Yeah, we uh, we certainly haven't found anything like it either, Brian. And from the from the clients we we've talked to, I, I'd say that there's a binary split between uh, between them. Uh, there's there's a camp where they've already worked out that their critical activities are fiercely dependent on these platforms, and they're out there looking for solutions or trying to cook their own up. And uh, we go and talk to them, and they're very very happy to to, to hear from us. And then there's the other category, uh, which are the ones where when you say this to them, they almost have that, um, uh, you know, penny drops moment and they suddenly look very worried. <laughs> but there is a, uh, the CTO of a, a Fortune 100 organization asked me the other day when I, when I was explaining this. They asked me uh, what proportion of companies fit, fitted into each one of those buckets, because unfortunately they fitted into the latter camp and were very relieved to hear that they weren't, they weren't on their own. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's it's definitely a there's definitely a, a challenge there overall. I think that uh, folks are really confronted with on on this issue that, um, and they don't always think about it, right? When they when they're first, sometimes when you first bring this up to organizations, they're like, "Huh, no, I've never really thought about this problem before." There's a lot of faith, I think, that these cloud based services will not have these kind of disruptions, but. You've already illustrated a couple examples today, and I know of some others uh, this year with Salesforce and Facebook and Zoom and others where these kind of outages do occur, whether through malfeasance, you know, from an external actor or there's an internal technical mistake that causes issues. Yeah, indeed. So, um, so, so what I'd say, Brian, is if if this is resonating with anyone, I'd I'd, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, no, no, no pressure. Let's uh, let's just talk through it and and work out if, if we can help you. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can get in touch with 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 Brian. Brian uh, Brian is well versed in in what we're doing. Or feel free to get in touch with me. It's Steve Rafe. You can connect and message with me on on LinkedIn, or check out our website, which is uh, which is starleafstandby.com. That's S T A R. L E A F S T A N B Y starleafstandby.com. And Steve, is there another link to your main product, uh, your your uh, your normal communications product? Is that starleaf.com or is it something comparable? It's a good guess. Yes, absolutely it yeah. is. Starleaf.com. <laughs> All right. All right, Steve, thanks for joining us today on the Managing Uncertainty Podcast. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Brian. Thanks for listening to this episode of Managing Uncertainty, produced by the experts at BrightPath. To receive notifications of new episodes, join our newsletter at brightpath.com or subscribe to your favorite podcast player, such as iTunes or Google Play. Learn more about the services and trusted advice from BrightPath by visiting brightpath.com. That's B-R-Y-G-H-T-P-A-T-H dot com.